pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to, the talk I'm going to give now actually is based on materials, as it says in the slides, uh, that Laura Lee Johnson put together, um, following up on what Dr. Gallen said, sort of all the great stuff in this talk is based on Laura Lee's materials. I'm sure I'll screw up parts of it, and of course that's all my blame. Um, as Laura Lee noted, we're going to want to have time for questions. I tell you what, this session was going to, what, 2.45? So I may try to, to sort of speed up some of this, because actually Laura Lee sort of gave me the easier parts of things. She, in fact, discussed all the complicated stuff relating to uh, interventional trials and that sort of thing. Um, so let me see if I could get the slides to work. Very good. Okay. So this is the chapter that you should read at some point or another to cover sort of epidemiology and observational studies, in particular observational studies. Um, what we're going to try to do is define epidemiology, identify a few common types of observational study design. So most of this session is going to be about observational study designs, understand how they may or may not be useful to you in terms of answering a question. Um, and, and I'm not trying to hide the result of this. So the bottom line is I'd like to conclude that these are actually very useful types of studies. Laura Lee indicated the gold standard is often an interventional study, but you're often not going to be able to do an interventional study. And um, so we're going to describe, there's not actually a massive amount of content in this part of it. So hopefully that will enable me to go through it a little more quickly, give us more time to, to ask questions of Laura Lee or if you have some questions of myself. But the main themes are that there aren't too many different types of observational studies. Let's get to the basic characteristics of them. A lot of them will share a number of faults, and Laura Lee sort of has already highlighted, highlighted those for you. Most particularly, you're not going to be able to prove causation with these studies. But, and this is a big but, even though you may not be able to prove causation, you may be able to use these sorts of studies to get a lot of the way toward suggesting that there really is causation. So again, the bottom line is that these could be incredibly useful types of studies to do. Particularly for, for if you're a junior researcher, you don't have access to you know, huge, massive amounts of money. You maybe don't have 10 people who are going to work full time to do your study for you. So one of the things I will do in terms of one of these studies is just coincidentally highlight a study I did. This was like 20 years ago. And I'm not pretending it was a great study. Um, I was just doing what my boss suggested, why don't you do the study. It worked out to be not, not that bad a study, I think. but. I'm risky, risking things, saying things here in front of all these statisticians, okay? Because, again, I, I should say I'm not a statistician. Um, you know, Laura Lee has been kind enough to let me give this talk, so let's see how it goes. Um, okay, so let me start getting this ahead. Okay, so we're going to go through a, a few de definitions at the beginning, particularly what a about epidemiology is about. We'll go through a few study designs. We'll say a few words about bias. It's a term that's already come up, and it's going to come up a number of times more. And then we'll go into some conclusions. And, if, and by the way, if you think I'm talking too fast, feel free to pass a note to people. I'll try to slow down a little bit. Okay. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. Let's start out with some definitions, and in particular what epidemiology is about. So two main themes here. We, so we have this slide, and you see it talks about the distribution and determinants of disease and injury. It doesn't necessarily have to be about humans. Most of what we're going to be talking about during this course is about humans, but it could be about animals or plants or some other thing. Um, and let me note, there are two types of, or two elements of epidemiology that this slide is highlighting. One is distribution. And distribution is classically about what we might call descriptive epidemiology. We're describing things. We're collecting a bunch of information about what we see in the world. But we're not trying to analyze it, OK? So that's descriptive. It's, it's the simpler part of epidemiology. How many people are there that have a particular disease? You know, that sort of thing. Just give me the facts, OK? 
the other part of it, so you got distribution and then you have determinants. Determinants is the more analytical part of it, and we often call that analytic epidemiology. So we want to go beyond describing, thank you, uh, we want to go beyond describing and we actually want to explain things. And this is getting to some of the issues that Laura Lee was talking about. Namely, can we go beyond just describing and try to ideally first show associations that we see most of the people getting this disease had a particular risk factor, something that happened to them a year or two, five years, whatever it is before they got the disease. And that's just an association. We'll see the types of studies we're talking about observational are not 100% in terms of proving causation, which is one step from association. You sort of see that two things kind of go together versus going one step further and trying to be able to conclude, we know, we have proven that this risk factor leads to this disease happening. That's ideally what we want to do, which gets back to our main theme in terms of what epidemiology at its heart is about, and you'll notice what it says here. Our understanding of the world is that in general, disease does not occur at random. There are causes for why things happen. Science governs our world, and epidemiology, all of the versions of it, are at its heart about demonstrating why our world works the way it is. What are the causes of disease? Can we understand those causes better so that ideally we could prevent a lot of disease or we could treat the disease, okay? So the assumption is again, we do not live in a random world. There are underlying principles at the heart of this and in particularly in terms of analytic ep epidemiology, we could gain enough information so that we could make educated guesses, hypotheses about the way the world is working and hopefully these, these will be very, very good guesses. So, so that's where we're going to sort of go and where epidemiology tries to go. Um, just to give you some examples, some people hear the word epidemiology, the word is similar to epidemic. Um, this is the sexy part of epidemiology. The Hot Zone is a book from like 40 years ago, which coincidentally was about an outbreak of Ebola in a bunch of monkeys, and they were of course worried about could it spread from monkeys? Could it mutate to it eventually go to human beings? And of course, we're seeing, you know, this is a long time ago, people in these, you know, protective space suit sort of things. And this is, give credit to Laura Lee, again, these are her materials. She had this in these slide sets a long time ago. And now, sadly, it's become highly relevant because we see now we have this huge troubling epidemic of Ebola virus um, in Africa and, and spreading around the world. Um, this is certainly a part of epidemiology, but the thing to remember is epidemiology is not at its heart or purely just about studying epidemics. In fact, in terms of the bulk of the studies that are done in epidemiology, a lot of them are probably very mundane. There are studies about epidemics. Uh, the slide notes, the Center for Disease Control in, in the U.S. The CDC has a team, that, that a unit that just deals with epide epidemics and watching them and seeing what's happening with them. Again, a very important part of epidemiology, but there are lots of other types of things that are part of e epidemiology. And ultimately, in terms of our goal of understanding, have a better understanding of our world, having a better understanding of what causes disease, it's probably the more mundane stuff that in terms of the ultimate impact may far more influence what we could do in terms of preventing disease and understanding it than just looking at the epidemics. Um, in terms of non-epidemic studies, uh, the slide notes, there are big cohort studies. We will talk about in a little bit about what a cohort study is. Laura Lee sort of already mentioned it. We follow people over a long period of time, often a large group of people, and see what happens to them. See which of them get a disease and then kind of look at what characteristics they had, what they'd been exposed to. Um, the nurses' health study is one of the studies in the U.S. that was a big, um, cohort type study. Again, these could be incredibly important studies to do. They can be expensive. Um, you don't necessarily just have to be studying an epidemic or even a big cohort study. Um, you could be doing a very small study, and we'll talk about some of those, and I'll give you some examples of those. They all could be very, very important studies. So don't 
think in your mind only certain types of studies, studying epidemics, studies involving tens of thousands of people who you follow for 20 years are the only ways that we do epidemiology. Many, many different ways of epidemiology. Keep your mind open to this. And, and again, my goal here is to make sure you feel empowered, that you appreciate the ways you could actually perhaps yourself conduct some of these studies and it may not be that hard to do and something you currently think is not believable that you could actually do your own important study you probably can do it uh, you got to think hard about how to do these sorts of studies but they definitely can be done um, you might have a notion that certain types of epidemiologic studies have been criticized and that the current thinking is that they're actually not very useful. And the best example of that probably, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, the thinking about hormone replacement therapy in women who are around the age of menopause. And for a long time, uh, the thinking was that this is a good thing for them in terms of heart disease and strokes. That in addition to helping prevent the bad symptoms you might have, hot flashes and other things, when a woman is going through menopause, giving them hormone replacement therapy would also prevent these bad problems of, of heart disease and strokes. And a lot of the evidence suggesting that came from classic epidemiologic studies. And eventually, we did some randomized gold standard trials, the trials that Laura Lee talked about, and those actually showed a very, very different result in terms of causation that in fact just the opposite of what we thought was true was in fact true. That if you used hormone replacement therapy for certain women for a certain period of time, they might actually develop more heart attacks and more strokes. Um, so you might think what this has demonstrated is that epidemiologic studies are not very useful. And the thing I would encourage you to do is don't take away that message. In fact, if you go back to the earlier epidemiologic studies, the non-randomized trials, if you looked at them a little more carefully, and some of this came out years ago too, they didn't necessarily prove that taking hormone replacement was going to do wonderful things in terms of preventing heart disease. In fact, if you did some of the more careful analysis, people back then were saying, hold on a second, maybe there are problems with hormone replacement therapy. So the bottom line is that good epidemiologic studies are very important, but whatever type of study you do, you got to do it well. That's a hard thing. That's one of the key lessons from all of these lectures. Doing medical research can be really, really hard, but I mean, it could be great stuff. You just got to think about all the issues. You got to understand what those issues are. You got to understand what the problems might be. And if you do all the hard work, you could come up with a wonderful study and come up with wonderful results. But bottom line, don't think just because it's you know, an observational epidemiologic study, it can't be really, really powerful. It can't be a breakthrough study. It often can be. Um, Sort of already mentioned epidemiology is hard, but it's hard in the sense that you got to understand the rules, you got to understand what you got to know to do a good study. Uh, a lot of this is hard just in the sense that you have to think about all these things and design your study well. It isn't necessarily hard in the sense that you need millions of dollars um, or, you know, tens of thousands of subjects. Um, they could be really, really great studies to do, but you just got to do the study well. This slide notes some of the things you got to be careful about. Um, you got to get a lot of data and you got to get good data and those are again two of the leading themes we want you to get out of this lecture. Get as much data as possible, measure as many things as you can while you do your study, measure the things well, measure them in a very consistent way, um, measure them often, um, some of this may sound easier than it is. It's not always easy to do, that's why the title, Epidemiology is Hard. We're gonna see the, the, the word bias show up numerous times. And bias, you know, I don't know in English, the usual way people think of bias is that a person is sort of thinking the wrong way. They're biased against something. They hate a certain class of people. They have a bad intent. 
That is not the use of bias in terms of the way we're going to talk about it. Bias just means you think you're doing the right thing, you think you're collecting the right data, and actually you're not because of some problems with maybe how you designed this study. And we're going to see that theme come up again and again and again, and what it comes down to is if you design your study correctly, you are going to specify ways to collect your data so that you do exactly the same thing if your study has two groups. You want to make sure that the cases you look at, you collect data from them in exactly the same way you collect it from the controls. Because if you're doing it in a different way, you may get different pieces of information from those two groups, and therefore what you are trying to prove isn't what you ultimately prove. You're just going to prove that you collected different types of data from one group versus the other group. That's not going to be a particularly useful thing in terms of sort of demonstrating how the world works. Um, two types of epidemiology. I think we already heard a little bit about it from Laura Lee. Um, this is sort of the pretty basic stuff you could think about. There's the interventional or experimental epidemiology where you're going to intervene in some way. You're going to try to treat somebody. You're going to change what they do in terms of having a risk factor or something. Um, and that was sort of the core of what Laura Lee was talking about in the earlier talk. Um, and now in this talk, we're going to mainly talk about observational epidemiology. And this is exactly what that word sounds like. You're going to observe the people. You're going to, in fact, try to not change anything that happens to them. All you're going to want to do is look at them and see what is happening to them. So you as the researcher are not intervening. In fact, you want to bend over backwards to see that you don't change things. You're just going to watch and you're going to collect good data and you're going to make sure that your data is collected the same way from everybody, but you're not changing anything. And as we saw, two types of data you could collect, two types of studies that are still observational, descriptive, just a lot of information, or analytical, the how and the why of things. Um, okay, uh, epidemiology um, in some sense could be viewed as hypothesis generating. Remember, and this is particularly in terms of uh, this ex the uh, analytical version of observational epidemiology. We want to explain the world. We want to explain why people have disease. We want to explain how the disease gets better or doesn't get better. And the question is, how do we even guess about that? Well, observational epidemiology could be a really great way to figure out ways to generate hypotheses. And not to, just to generate sort of random hypotheses, like you're throwing darts somewhere, but good hypotheses, hypotheses that may eventually be demonstrated to be true. Um, this may be the only information you could actually get in terms of generating hypotheses. A fundamental limitation on these studies, Laura Lee pointed out, that will get repeated multiple times throughout this talk and perhaps through later talks during this week, is Observational epidemiology is about figuring out association, seeing that one thing sort of is associated, is paired with, shows up all the time with some other thing. They kind of go together. On the other hand, it's not very good at proving 100% that there is causation. There are many other things that could go be between seeing an association versus there being causation. Uh, one of which is the notion of confounding, that there's actually some other thing that's causative here, and you're just not measuring that thing. So again, a fundamental limitation of these studies, but, and this is getting back to the ultimate message, even though it's a fundamental limitation, it's not a horrible limitation. Just getting associations with other data together could be incredibly useful, and you could basically be almost as good as as a randomized trial in terms of getting very, very close to proving something. So that's, again, the sort of party line I'm sort of giving you. Um, yeah, this is just sort of the same theme, better than guessing out of thin, thin air, just a good observational epidemiologic study can be powerful. 
Um, I want to build a little bit about some of the things John Gallen noted. Um, he had a wonderful slide on Austin Bradford Hill, uh, who is a very smart guy, a very famous statistician working in the 1940s and 1950s. And, and, and Dr. Gallen told us about um, one of the studies he did looking at using a new antibiotic, streptomycin, to treat tuberculosis. And he did a randomized trial. Um, and a, a lot of wonderful things actually historically came out of that trial in terms of other aspects of how we do trials. And one was that, uh, bringing in a little ethics here, um, he randomized people and he argued that given we had a limited supply of the antibiotic at the time, not only was randomizing us people good because it helped us prove causation, but it was also fair. Because again, we sort of flipped a coin and everybody had an equal, everybody in the trial had an equal 50-50 chance of getting the drug. You're gonna see how so many of the things we raise during these talks are relevant to things we're seeing, for example, with Ebola. I, sure, I suspect many of you have followed the original issues about which people were actually getting this really, really tiny amount of, of these experimental drugs we had when we know this disease is killing a high percentage of the people who are infected with it. So we see that the same themes recur time and time again. They're actually, for a lot of the big themes, not that many things that you really sort of have to learn because they re and reoccur. Oh, and the other thing that Dr. Bradford Hill did in this study was he picked up on the idea that was noted earlier in, in John's talk in terms of uh, blinding. Um, he's looking at tuberculosis, and during that study, remember it was randomized, they did x-rays to figure out how the, the subjects were doing. He said, I don't want the people reading the x-rays to know whether this person is being treated with the drug or not being treated with the drug. This is the whole bias notion. You're going to see the same theme. Not that these people reading the x-rays were evil or anything, but if they're sitting there in front of an x-ray that says, person treated with streptomycin on the top of it, subconsciously they may be thinking, boy, this looks much better than their chest x-ray from a month ago. Uh, if they have no clue whether this person is treated or not, they can't subconsciously or not affect their thinking about whether or not this person, this x-ray is or is not better. Okay, so this is other stuff Bradford Hill did, but one of the things he's also quite famous for is this paper he wrote about indicating that, look, these epidemiologic studies they're not randomized, and again, he's a person who did randomized trials. But even though they're not randomized, they could pr demonstrate, help us go from association to causation. But what we gotta do, and, and I may be mischaracterizing, we gotta use a lot of common sense. And you'll see, and, and in fact, he doesn't like these being called his criteria, because a lot of them got changed. And in fact, I'll, I'll talk with a few, about a few of the criteria. Uh, the first criterion here is statistical significance. And interestingly, in his paper, he didn't even give it a number. It was at the end of the list. And what he basically said about statistical significance was, maybe we're worrying, and this is from a statistician, maybe we're worrying a little too much about the statistical significance stuff. And, and John did the great job of highlighting the scurvy trial. And right, we had the two people who got cured who, because they got the lemons and the limes and totally not statistically significant. But it's a landmark paper that was incredibly useful in terms of teaching us how to cure a, a horrible disease. Totally not statistically significant. Um, but what Bradford Hill sort of tells us is, Oh, and he was complaining, actually. Um, I guess what, he's British, and he was complaining about what was happening with US journals back in the 50s, where a lot of the journals wouldn't even publish your paper if you didn't have statistically significant results. And this was coming from him as a statistician, and a very famous one saying, this is stupid. I mean, there are many wonderful papers that may not have statistically significant results. And what are these US journal editors doing refusing to publish some of these results just because they're not statistically significant? Um, to give you a flip side of that, OK, so obviously we see in the scurvy paper can have wonderful results that people look at that and say, gee, we know this is meaningful. Doesn't matter that it's not statistically significant. Um, we mentioned Facebook earlier on. I don't know how many of you are familiar, show of hands. There was a study Facebook did about, a, or reported a month or two ago, about it was manipulating people's emotions. Have any of you heard about this? Has it? 
Been told, okay, so some of you have heard about it. Basically, if you're on Facebook, and I guess most of you are, um, you get a news feed all the time they're telling you things about what's happening with your friends' lives. Well, Facebook, there was an interest, and give them credit, it was a fascinating study. There was always a concern that, are we happier when we learn that all our friends' wonderful things are happening in their lives? They just gave birth to triplets, and, and their kid just, you know, was went to the best university in Brazil, they got admitted, and all these wonderful things. You're sitting there, and kind of it's been a bad day, and do you feel even worse that all your friends are having all these wonderful things happen to you? Or do you feel better because they're all your friends, and you think, wow, I feel so warm and good inside that my friends are having happy lives. And there was data out there from some studies that went different ways, and Facebook genuinely wanted to see about this. And so what Facebook did is it slightly manipulated the news you were getting. It, you still got it from your friends, but it delayed some of the news so that for certain people on particular days, th they filtered it so it gave you more of the positive news. And then for certain other people, they gave you more negative news, and they wanted to see which way did it affect your feelings. So they then looked at the messages you sent and looked at them, coded them for how many happy words or how many sad words were in your messages. And this was, this is, we live in a different world now in terms of being able to have internet studies and things like that. Because what Facebook did over one week, it had something, I may have the number wrong. I think it was something like 600,000 subjects in this study, which is easy for Facebook, because right there are hundreds of millions of people on Facebook. So they did this for a week and had like 600,000 subjects, 300,000 randomized to get more of the negative stuff more quickly, 300,000 got the more positive stuff more quickly, and they eventually demonstrated that actually you, you feel good about what's happening to your friends, okay? It wasn't the reverse, okay? That, that you feel worse when your friends are doing well. So if you hear good news from your friends, you're gonna feel a little better. Well, if you actually look at the statistics, what they demonstrated, and it was a pretty significant statistical value, p-value was very, very low, was that one in every 4,000 words that one of these people who got the manipulated feed would be flipped from being positive to being negative. You could ask yourselves, does that mean much of anything? And I think most people would say, it basically is as if there was no effect at all. Which is a good thing to know. The bottom line is, look, hearing better news or worse news from your friends isn't gonna dramatically affect how you feel on a particular day. But they said it actually showed that, you know, if your friends are doing well, you'll do well. But again, one word in 4,000, okay? And what this demonstrates, and the statisticians could comment further on, but apparently, if you have enough subjects, you will get statistical significance. But you may prove something that, in, in terms of its magnitude, is meaningless, okay? That, you've altered this person's mindset so that of the 4,000 next words they write this day, one of them will be a little more positive or a little more negative. Probably means you didn't do much of anything in terms of changing how they felt. And we could separately, if you want to, afterwards talk about the ethics of the study, because this has raised a huge issue that it was, un some people claim it was unethical for Facebook to manipulate people's emotions in this horrible way. Okay. So anyhow, the bottom line is these criteria here um, are, a version of what Bradford Hill said, even if you're just doing one of these, you know, observational epidemiologic studies, there's a lot of common sense you could look at. And one of the things, again, he didn't like was statistical significance. But other things you should look at, strength of association. Um, for example, um, when, when people started looking at smokers, and remember for decades in the middle of the 1900s, there was this huge dispute out there that the tobacco companies would say, smoking doesn't cause anything bad in people. Well, if you actually started doing the numbers, just observing what is happening to smokers, you would discover that in terms of developing lung cancer, a smoker was 30 times more likely to develop lung cancer than a non-smoker. If you see something like that, it's like, bells should go off. This sounds a little strange. Something real might be happening. This might be an association that demonstrates something in terms of really having causation there. Um, 
John was telling us about the example of the pump. John Snow, and when he did that study of cholera and how it was spreading around the pump. Well, what he saw was that people living near the pump were 14 times more likely than people away from the pump in terms of developing cholera. Again, you see that sort of difference. It's probably, it could be chance, but it's probably not going to be chance. So again, something like the strength of association, uh, dose response relationships. The more somebody is affected by a risk factor, if you see more disease, that makes sense. That's the sort of thing we expect risk factors to do if they're real risk factors. Temporal sequence. If you see that the thing you think is the cause is occurring after the person already has the disease, that's sort of a bad thing to see. It's going to kind of indicate to you something wrong is happening here. This is not good in terms of cause and effect. Uh, biological plausibility is on here. You know, does it make sense in terms of biology? Again, an interesting thing that Bradford Hill said is don't pay that much attention to biological plausibility because the world is actually complicated. Whatever God or whoever created us, us, he did a really complicated thing in terms of doing this. We often don't have a clue how our biology works. So just because we don't have a plausible explanation for what we see, if the data is otherwise demonstrating something, we see temporal sequence, we see a huge effect, um, in fact, I'll tell you later on during this week about a study that my office encountered where people had no clue for something they were seeing, but they kept getting p-values of 0 0.0001. And they blew it off because they said, we don't know why this is happening. And it was sort of bad that they ignored it. Um, it's fascinating stuff. Okay, but so again, this is part of the, the main message to get out of this. Doing epidemiologic studies, observational, could be fine and just use all these other criteria. Okay, so now let's go through, uh, we're gonna go through a few study designs. And there are only three or four that we're gonna talk about, and they're the major ways we actually do these sorts of studies. Um, the first, and I'll try to go through this fairly quickly, because um, Laura Lee noted it or something, case reports and case series. Unlike some of the others that we're gonna talk about here, um, these, do not involve comparison groups. It's basically, you've encountered, you the researcher, have seen something strange, something unusual, something unexpected. And in, ideally, you've seen it not just in one person, maybe you've asked around for some of your colleagues, you've seen it in a few people. So let's just write it up. Let's just write up this unusual thing that's happening. And the notion is, well, sometimes unusual things happen just because it's chance. You know, we live in a world where there is a lot of randomness, and it could be chance. But it could be that it's occurring, you know, depending on how unusual it is. You're seeing an unusual thing happen, not just in one person, but in five people, and it's very, very unusual. You suddenly start thinking, maybe there is something actually happening here, something strange that's new that we've never seen before. And so you just write it up. You don't need a comparison group. All you need is a bunch of information. Going back to our themes about good epidemiology, you need to write out the rules are in terms of how did you find these people? What is it you're measuring about them? Are you measuring it accurately? You're trying to measure it without bias? And, and you try to do all that. And, and these, these can be very, very nice studies to do. And I think we just have a few slides sort of again saying all of that. So, okay, you observe the people, you describe them, the data has to be well defined. Um, I think this is sort of say, saying the same thing. Okay, uh, part of what you're going to do, not just in this type of study, but in other studies, just so we all know some of the basic terms, you're often going to do certain ways of describing your data. And we're not going to say a lot about it during these talks, but you should know the difference between a mean. The mean is just an average. So I think I had an example, right? If we had five numbers and they were 1, 2, 4, 5, and 33, all you do is add them up, five numbers, you add them up, you divide by five, that's your average, that's your mean. In this case, you get 45, you divide by five, you get a mean of nine. Uh, there are, for almost anything we're going to talk about, there are different measures you could use, and depending on what you're doing, you may want to give several measures, okay? So median, median is sort of the middle value. Half of the values are lower than it, half of the values are higher than it. So in those numbers I was giving you before, one, two, four, five, thirty-three, four is the middle value. Notice four is much smaller than nine that we got from the average. And this gets back to the 
point, and it depends on what sort of numbers you're calculating, different measures have different strengths and different problems. The mean can be much more affected by a very large value that's an outlier. So the numbers I gave you, all of them were small except for the 33. That raised the mean from close to four to around nine. It, it more than doubled it. On the other hand, um, the median is less affected by one or another value if you have a, a number of other values, okay? Things, standard deviation and error, these are different calculations to measure the distribution, um, where the values are. Do they cluster around a small point? Are they spread out? That sort of thing. Um, confidence limits and intervals are another way of sort of, again, measuring the spread of the data. One thing to keep in mind in terms of the case studies, case reports, you need bigger numbers for these sorts of measures to be really meaningful, okay? So if you're doing small sets of numbers, just be aware this isn't probably going to tell you uh, all that sort of much. Um, case reports and case series can be very good in terms of generating hypothesis. Again, if you're seeing something unusual, it may tip you in terms of thinking, gee, what's happening here? Um, it, it, it could be better than, you know, well, it could be better than other things, okay? Uh, often the things you're going to look at in terms of generating these hypotheses or looking at clinical experience, what you think might be happening. You've got to worry about a bunch of things. These are going to be the same things pretty much we're going to worry about in any of these types of studies. You don't want biases in terms of patient selection. That's a particular problem in a case report because you're just picking these cases. You're looking out there and trying to find some cases that you think are similar in a certain way, and therefore there may be a lot of bias in terms of how you, you pick them. It's very different than randomly selecting from a large group of patients. Um, could always be due to chance, okay? So again, it's hard to know what you're proving in terms of these studies. On the other hand, the thing to keep in mind is all studies have their strengths, and there's sort of the poster child, the great le object lesson that people often look to in terms of case reports. Uh, this is a very, very famous one. You're probably familiar with it, perhaps. Um, when AIDS first was showing up, the reason people first learned about AIDS was because, you know, reports from the US CDC, uh, starting with the Los Angeles branch of it, some people started noticing some patients that were having a very, very unusual thing happen to them. And in particular, the first thing they reported, this was in 1981, was, in fact, John, right, you discussed this, uh, pneumocystis. Um, um, yeah, pneumocystis pneumonia. And this was a type of disease that normally was only seen in people who had some sort of problem with their immune system. And suddenly they had five cases in which this was seen in people who, prior to getting this infection, were perfectly healthy, as far as anybody knew. And so this made no sense. You did not see this disease in somebody unless they had an immune problem. And so they reported this. Um, and the other thing they noted, which was very rare to say in a case report, this had something to do, it was strange that all of these, these were healthy men who also happened to be homosexuals. So you're just seeing a number of pieces of information that were just very unusual, and it was all coming together. And they did this report, and then within a few months later, we saw clusters of men, again relatively healthy men, who had another problem, a type of cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma. And this was another type of cancer that you normally wouldn't see in this group of men. So you're quickly getting these strange reports of very, very unusual things. And often, again, this could be a chance circumstance. In this case, it wasn't. It was a brand new disease that people were seeing in human beings. And this is a wonderful example of how compelling a good case report or a case series can be. Uh, I mean, it, it's just wonderful work. Okay, so the next group we go on to, uh, cross-sectional studies. Um, I think Laura Lee already sort of described these. Um, these are, are pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to give you a definition in a moment, but basically, ideally, you're, you're, this is sort of the snapshot type of thing. You're going to look at what's out there, and you're just sort of going to describe it very, very well. And in particular, you're often looking at prevalence. And I'll give you, the next slide gives you a definition of what prevalence is. So you're going to sort of describe the population and you're going to describe a disease. 
The main take from this slide are two somewhat different concepts. Prevalence is a measure of how much disease is out there at a particular point in time. And there's an easy formula for it. You sort of cal you look at a particular population, you go through that population, you want to define it. So you know what group you're studying, and you look at everybody in that population, a group that might theoretically get a particular disease, and you just count how many of them have the disease, on the, that's the top, the numerator, and on the bottom you put how many people you looked at. And that ratio is basically saying what percentage of this population has the disease. A snapshot in time, that's what prevalence is about. Um, often a very useful thing to know. Incidence, the second concept we're getting here, at here, is very, very different. Incidence is how many new cases of a disease are happening over a certain period of time. Incidence, you cannot define incidence. It is not a concept that makes any sense unless you know what period of time you're looking at. Because over time, depending on how long you look, more and more people are going to develop a disease. So you may say, what is the incidence of diabetes in Brazil um, during 2014? Okay, you're going to look over that year. You're going to look at everybody who might theoretically develop the disease or some subpart, but you have to define it correctly. And then you count how many developed the disease. Okay, so unlike prevalence, you're not looking at a point in time just how many have it. You're looking the change, the new cases over a period of time. Both are very, very useful concepts. They tell you very, very different things, but they're two terms that often show up in, in these types of studies, in these cross-sectional studies. Um, these are just sort of characteristics of how you do a good study. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because we've sort of already raised these even in terms of the case studies. You need to define, 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 define. Everything you do in your study should be defined clearly, should be defined as objectively as possible so that everybody else would know exactly what you did and, and they could figure out whether there's any bias. It should be standardized, apply the same collection method to everybody. Um, okay, now this slide is about how you report the results. And you see the two bulleted items. You're going to discover a theme here. I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Remember, Epidemiologic studies have the descriptive aspects, just giving you a lot of numbers, describing what's out there. And the second part of it is the analytic aspect, trying to show associations, trying to eventually go from associations to perhaps suggesting things, hypotheses about causation. Um, descriptive stuff is some of the numbers we've already talked about. Analyses, we're starting to get into some ways you could actually analyze your data in terms of showing associations. I'm going to give you one point to take home that you will see in the slides again and again, and I'll try to go through more quickly. Um, you could do two by two tables, and we'll see one in the next slide, that look at one risk factor. And often you do a chi-square test, um, t-test, whatever. And Ideally, those are not the best things to do because you've zeroed in already on only one risk factor. There are other methods where we're not sure what the risk factor is that you could use all that wonderful data. Remember, you collect a lot of data. You collect as much data as possible. You could be doing logistic regression. You could be doing standard linear regression. Those are all techniques that are more powerful and that don't require you to start assuming that you already know the risk factor you want to look at. So you may see a lots of these two by two tables, but when you do your study, you want to think about perhaps using a more powerful statistical technique. This is just an example of what the two by two tables will look like. Again, you see you have the risk factor, you have the disease, disease, no disease, and you just put the numbers in each of those squares, and then you could do a few types of tests by looking at the different ratios in terms of the columns and the rows. Again, ideally, when you do your study, you're probably not going to want to rely on this. Think of doing regression. It's more powerful. It, it allows you to learn more things from the data. Um, yeah, this slide is just, again, telling you about the stuff in the tables. And again, I'm trying to go a little faster so we could get to sort of have the time for questions. Uh, positive attributes about these types of studies. Uh, they could be fairly inexpensive to do if it's a common disease, so it's easy to find the subjects. Uh, remember, in the case studies, you were picking them. Here, you could be picking people from a broad population, so it's more representative. 
it could be fairly short in terms of doing these studies. Uh, you could be narrowing down on a particular population. You could measure lots and lots of things. Um, some downsides and why it may not be good to do this. Not good for rare diseases. If the disease comes and goes very quickly, you have it for two days, it's hard to do these studies. If somebody, lots of people are refusing to give you data to answer your questions, that's gonna make it hard to do. Um, Laurelie already noted time can be a confounder. If the disease is gonna get better, it's a cold, it gets better in five days, you could be giving them a wonderful treatment and seeing all the people with the treatment are better in five days, it wouldn't have mattered what treatment you gave them. They're all going to be better in five days. Again, time can be a problem in terms of doing these sorts of studies. Um, here are just some examples of these types of studies. Um, so you have these. You could look them up later and read about them. Um, the first one, well, actually, both of them are involving a study, a, a way of collecting data in the US called NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And these are pretty straightforward studies to do. They were looking at overweight and obesity among US children uh, and adolescents and adults. And all they did was they basically go out and they pick a random sample of people and measure like their weight and their height and they calculate this, what, body mass index. And they do it one year and then they do it a few years later and see how things are changing. And they did it, in this case, they were looking at 4,000 adults and 4,000 children. Because it's a good sample, they could get very good data just from those 4,000 to predict what are true ratios or you know, percentages of people for the entire country, entire US, millions and millions of people. So again, these can be very, very powerful types of studies. Okay, let's go on to a type of study called a case control study. Um, Okay, what we're trying to do in this sort of study is we're looking at a particular outcome, like a person getting a disease or not, and we're trying to figure out what risk factors might cause this disease to take place. And this is a, a very useful technique in particular for some of the areas that are not very useful in terms of what we just talked about, okay, in terms of the cross-sectional study. In particular, this is very good for rare diseases and diseases that it takes a long time from the exposure until when you actually have the disease. And a wonderful thing about these types of studies is that, that they could be quicker and less expensive than cohort studies. And so what do you do in these studies? You need a representative group of people with the disease. We call these people the cases. And then you re need a representative group of people who are disease free. And these are controls. And ideally, this gets back to this name, main theme, you don't want any bias in terms of picking these people. Ideally, the controls should be from the same population that the cases are from. This may not be that easy to do in this study. This may be the hardest type of thing to do, to make sure that both both groups are sort of from the same population. But on the other hand, if you could do it, it could be really, really powerful. So this is showing all there really is in terms of this study. On the left side, disease side, those are your cases. You find a bunch of people who have the disease, and all you're going to do is try to accurately, in the same way for both groups, figure out which of those cases were exposed to these various risk, risk factors you think might be relevant and which were not exposed. And you do the same thing for another group that doesn't have the disease. Again, hopefully from a similar population. And all you're basically doing is looking at that exposed to non-exposed ratio in the disease group versus the non-disease group. Obviously, right, if the disease group has a much greater ratio of exposure to the, a particular risk factor, you might think maybe this risk factor is causing that disease. Otherwise, why would all of these people have been more likely to have been exposed? So that's sort of what's going on there. Um, again, these are sort of the themes we've already talked about, picking the two populations. Um, discussing a little bit how you could find the cases. You should have appropriate selection criteria. You might go to admission records in a hospital, registries kept you know, by certain groups in terms of who has a disease. Uh, the controls are trickier. Um, you're never gonna get a control group. Laura Lee discussed this a little bit. Um, ideally, sometimes you might just get one group of controls from one population, but often that might be a problem. So you may need to get different ways to get different 
samples of controls and merge those groups together in a more complicated control group. And we're discussing here different places you could get controls, from a hospital, a general population, a neighborhood, et cetera. Um, could be costly to get controls. Yeah, okay. Uh, how do you analyze it? One way you could analyze these are exactly what we showed you before in the other type of study. You could do the little two by two table. Um, again, standard theme, maybe you want to try regression. Regression may enable you to get more out of your data. It's sort of a better way to do this. Um, this is exactly what we saw before. Maybe you want to use a reg regression. Okay, what are positives about this type of study? It lets you study rare diseases. You could study multiple factors. It's not all that time consuming compared to other things. And again, if you do it correctly, if you meet all the assumptions, it could be a powerful technique. Um, negatives, it doesn't let you estimate incidence or prevalence, even relative risk, how risky it is, you know, one risk factor versus not having a risk factor, it's only indirectly measured. Bias could be an issue in terms of picking the control group. Uh, hard to study, something that it's an exposure that doesn't happen a lot. Um, so those are some of the problems. Here's a very powerful and famous example of a case control design. Um, young women were, discovering, were discovered to have a rare type of tumor. Remember, a lot of the things we learn from, like we did from the AIDS, are because something very unusual is happening out there. And so what we were seeing at a certain point in time, let me just get this. Okay, so these were women who were uh, between age 15 and 22, and in one hospital they saw seven, seven women with this relatively young age, and they had a rare form of vaginal cancer that almost never was seen in women that young. You would see them in much older women. And it was like within a period of like, you know, a few years they suddenly found seven young women with this horrible form of cancer that normally shows up in 50 or 60 year olds. It was, what is going on here? And so what they did was a case control study. They had the cases, they had the seven young women, and then they basically tried to pick other young women, again, the same population, who didn't have this type of cancer, and then they collected a ton of data, but tried to collect it the same way on both groups. And then they just compared the data and saw were there differences in terms of what seemed to be happening in the data relating to the cases versus the controls. And what they picked up was something you might have thought was very hard to figure out. It worked out that their moms, their, their, yeah, when, when they were pregnant, had taken a particular drug that you take sometimes during pregnancy, and it had this horrible side effect that nobody, of course, knew about, because how would you figure it out? It wasn't doing anything to the mom. It wasn't even doing anything immediately to, to their daughters. It was taking like 15 to 20 years to cause a form of cancer, and yet this study picked that up. I mean, astounding that you could learn this sort of thing from, from this wonderful sort of study. And how are we doing time-wise? Okay, um, so I will spend maybe a couple minutes on this, just because here's a study that was not particularly important, did not kind of hit all these headlines, but the only reason it's here is because I did this study when I was a fellow. Uh, but I just wanted to empower you, okay? It was a study about, there's a bad thing, when you do eye surgery, the middle of your eye actually it's easy to get an infection if bacteria gets into it because it's actually this big ball of jelly. And because we want to see well, God or whoever designed us, there's not a lot of blood vessels in the middle because if there were, of course, the light couldn't get to the retina, the screen in the back, okay? So if bacteria get in there, they could really get going. It's like, let's all jump into the swimming pool and start reproducing and everything. Um, so after eye surgery, it doesn't happen a lot. Remember, these studies are good for rare things that are otherwise hard to study. But after eye surgery, sometimes you get a thing called endophthalmitis, which just is a fancy name for an infection inside your eyeball. Not a good thing to have. Often the outcome of it, even with good treatment, is not good. You could lose vision. This is a disaster. Most eye surgeons hate, of course, to see this ever happen in their cases. It generally happens about one case in a thousand. Not a lot, again, but if you're the one case, obviously it's a horrible thing for the patient. Even the doctor feels bad. Is it something I did? Is it something I could prevent the next time? So 
I was a fellow, I was working out with a guy who said, let's see if we could do a case control study for this. It was an eye hospital in New York City that had a lot of patients, so he said, let's find the cases of anophthalmitis after eye surgery that we had the last three years. And we looked, fairly easy to do, he just went through the medical records, because this was a, a coded diagnosis, there were 54 patients who had this bad thing happen to them. And so, the tricky thing is you need controls. In this case, we went back and we said, okay, let's look at everybody admitted to this hospital for eye surgery over those three years, and let's randomly pick a sample of them. We picked four controls, so we had four times as many controls as the cases. Not huge numbers, right? 54 cases, about 200 controls, um, and we just sort of ran the numbers. Um, and I was the person doing most of this, and I'm just using this as a case to show you could do this. Um, I did the data, I was pretty much doing this myself on my fellowship year, um, and as I started running the data, sort of, this demonstrates some of these key things. You need a lot of data. So one of the things we did was, we, anything we had in the medical chart about any history of medical problems people had got recorded. If there were gaps in the chart, my job was to call up the surgeon and see if we could plug the gaps in the data, make sure we have as much data as we could get. Um, so I started collecting the data and everything. Um, the most common surgery in ophthalmology by far is cataract removal. Um, and oh, going back to, does any of this matter? Well, one chance in a thousand when there are more than a million cataract surgeries in the U.S. each year, I'm sure the numbers are much greater for the whole world, that adds up to real numbers. You would have more than a thousand cases of endophthalmitis each year. So that's a big deal. Well, so I started looking at the data, and one of the things we discovered, of course, most of the cases were cataract surgery. Well, in general, most of the cases and controls were cataract surgery. One of the things you do in cataract surgery is you put in a little lens, a little plastic lens to replace your own lens. And I was just looking over the data and starting to notice that Lots of lenses are just by different companies. You can make a lot of money by making lenses. And I noticed that several of the cases seemed to be about the same type of lens by the same manufacturer. And it was like, what in God's name does this mean? And so I was just kind of guessing. And one of the things you looked at, because you wanted to be objective, was that different lenses were made out of different types of plastic. And so I was trying to sort of code the data and get as much information as we can out of the data. And it worked out, in fact, that the lenses that I was sort of seeing the higher rate on seem to have, the lenses have these little arms on the sides of them. Because the way you put the lens in, it kind of gets into this little bag that used to be your old lens. And these two, two arms on the side kind of snap out. And so it looked like some of the arms that were made of this different type of plastic seem to have more of the cases. And I started coding that, and it was actually borderline, well, 0.01, so it was statistically significant. So I was telling my boss this, and he was saying, nah, there's no way we're going to, because, so we did the regression, and we only got three statistically significant things, one of which was this material that the lens was made out of. And my boss, who was this prestigious ophthalmologist, you know, was saying, we, we, this isn't going to work or something. So he had me hunt around a little bit, and I was just looking through the literature, and discovered a report, not clinical at all, but some guy who took different types of plastic and exposed them to bacteria and discovering bacteria have preferences in terms of sticking to different types of plastic and they actually like to stick to the type of plastic that they were seeing this association with. And so at that point the boss said, okay, maybe there's something to it. We wrote it up, we submitted it, and so at the same time I had written up for him a randomized trial about how to prevent this infection. You put this type of betadine antibiotic, not antibiotic, an antiseptic on your eyes. Well, he had spent years doing this other study because he actually had to randomize all the patients over several years, sort of a cluster randomized trial. He was trying to get both into this journal and the journal saw the paper about the case control study and really loved it. Didn't like the other paper but said, if you'll put the case control study in this paper in our journal, we'll take the other one. They published both. Both. And the case control one, they both got a fair amount of attention, but our conclusion was that if you actually change the materials in the lenses, you could reduce the amount of endophthalmitis in the country by more than 50%. And, you know, I don't think they actually use that much of the other type of plastic these days. So just, I mean, again, 
I wasn't an expert in epidemiology or anything. This is a study that one person with good advice could conduct. Think about this stuff. You don't need millions of dollars to come up with wonderful discoveries. Um, so now we're going to talk about our last class of study, which is a cohort study. And this is pretty much very similar. Remember I told you the case control study. Case control study, we looked at the conclusion, namely how many people got a disease. The cohort study is imagine going backwards from the case control study. We start out with a group of people, none of them have the disease, and all we're gonna do is watch them over time and see which of them developed the disease and then compare those to the ones who didn't develop the disease. So all the case control study was looking at the end of it, the result when we already saw who had the disease and trying to figure out who should be the controls. The cohort study is just looking at people over time and just starting out with a group, we don't know who has the disease, we think there are some risk factors, we we try to get some people, hopefully, who have the risk factors and some who don't, watch them over time and then see who has the disease and who doesn't. And you just run the numbers. Um, and this is a great chart kind of showing you this. And notice on the right side and the left side, there are just two different ways to do this study. You could do it prospectively. So you could start out right now and find a bunch of people who might be, some of them are exposed to a risk factor. and watch them over time, depending on how long it takes to get the disease, and eventually you look at the ones that get the disease and the ones that didn't and see which of them were exposed to which risk factors. A very, very different way to do it, but the same, theoretically the same thing is, you could do all of this with historical data. As Laura Lee noted, the hard thing is to find a group for which you actually have this data for the entire period of time. But you could do the study right now with people who your group started in 1980, and now you're looking at them in 2010 or something, or 2014. You're doing exactly the same analysis, except instead of going over time, you starting with an, an earlier year and going forward over time. Um, again, a, a great way of sort of doing things. Um, these are just sort of basics of what I already told you in terms of identifying the various groups. Um, and again, the two versions of it. You could do it retrospectively or you could do it prospectively. Again, it could be hard or easy to do depending on which of those you do, but conceptually you're doing the same thing. Uh, you gotta define what it means to be exposed, not to be exposed. Uh, you gotta define your outcomes. Yeah, and this is sort of describing the studies. And again, same thing, exactly the same calculations we were talking about before. Ideally, you don't wanna just do a two by two uh, you want to do regression. So what, what are good attributes of these studies? The cases you're looking at are more representative in case control. Uh, there's more natural history information. Um, incident rates are available. You could directly estimate relative risk. These are all positives. There's less bias because you're looking at a big population. You could determine relationship to exposures. Uh, you could look at rare exposures. Now what are problems with these, right? All things have some good things, some bad things. You may need really long follow-up, right? You may be studying people over a really long time. You need a lot of people, okay? So if I did uh, a cohort study for my ophthalmology thing, I might have had to spend several years doing the study instead of like three months. I probably would have looked at a thousand times as many people. I looked at 250 people. You would have had to look at 250,000 people to do this as a cohort study. Again. Each of these have their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, and th these are just some examples of, of studies that were done using this technique. Very, very classic one. In fact, this is uh, Dr. Hill is showing up again as the co-author of the first one. And Richard Dahl, another, another famous uh, clinician researcher. All he did was they were still trying to figure out does smoking you know, cause cancer? He just sent a survey to every doctor in England asking you, how much do you smoke? Do you not smoke at all? Do you smoke a pack a day? Do you smoke three packs a day? He got a large response, and then they basically have medical records in England that would allow you to determine when people die and what the cause of, of death is. And so four years later, they went through the death records and actually got highly statistically significant results demonstrating that, duh, smoking was highly associated. We didn't prove it, but highly associated with developing lung cancer. And they then actually did a much better study kind of looking over 50 years of observations. They just kind of extended it eventually. But again, showing you how powerful these sorts of studies can be.
Um, this is just another example looking at head injury in wartime, and so we had medical records, so you could look at World War II and which people had bad head injuries during World War II, and then you went forward 50 years and looked at their military records, and because they go to these certain hospitals so you could see their records, and see which of them developed the dementia. Again, you need a long time, you need to be able to get the historical data, but if you do it, it's great stuff. Um, Here's another different type of study, but people looked after the World Trade Center went down. This was a whole new thing. What horrible things would happen to these people because they were roaming around, breathing in all this horrible stuff from all these buildings that collapsed and everything. And so they surveyed a bunch of them and then looked at them five, six years down the road to see which of them developed asthma, which of them uh, developed post-traumatic stress disorder. And so, you know, Wonderful papers, and again, you have the citations if you want to look these up. Um, I won't say much about this. Often you could do case control studies within a broader study that you've done for a different purpose. These are called nested studies. Um, the more common one is where you do a nested case control. Often you'll do that because you've like frozen some biospecimen as part of the bigger study, but it's very expensive to do certain tests on it. So remember, the, the case control, you only need a small group. So you basically figure out who got this disease that you want to study, look at their biospecimens, and then just look at a smaller control group. And it, it's fairly inexpensive to do. Nested case hort, uh, I won't go into because it's kind of complicated. Um, Okay, so we're on summary, and so hopefully we do have at least some time for questions. Uh, in the summary, we've sort of gone over something. There are all different types of observational studies. Oh, we can have types of bias. Remember, bias is error. The bottom line is when you have bias, you think you're measuring something, but you're measuring something different. And there are two common ways you could have bias. There are some others. There can be selection bias or there could be observation bias. Selection bias is just you're not picking the people you should be picking. So this control group you're supposed to be picking, you did something wrong in terms of how you picked them. They're not exactly the right group that you should have picked, okay? And these are just giving you different ways you could have picked the wrong group. Um, observation bias, okay, this is you're looking at the right person, but what you're measuring is not what you should be measuring. So maybe you're asking more questions about risk factors from the control group than from the case group, okay? That's a bias because the more intensively you ask something, you're more likely to get an answer. You want to do everything identical in terms of both groups. So again, various ways you can get bias there. Uh, the conclusions, we already know them. Observational studies are very useful. They can be cheap. They can be efficient. Don't downplay them. Don't think they're, they're worse than they can be. Do they always agree with uh, gold standard randomized trials? No. But that doesn't tell you which is better. You could also do bad randomized controlled trials. So you, again, you've got to know the strengths of both types of studies. Uh, yeah, you've got to worry about confounding in, in these epidemiologic studies. Now, sometimes you're not going to be able to do a randomized trial. We're not going to do a randomized trial in which we want to know more about smoking. So let's randomize 1,000 people. Half of them we tell them to smoke, and half of them we tell them not to smoke. Obviously, that's probably considered unethical by lots of people. Uh, not good to intentionally expose somebody to something you think may cause cancer. Um, lots of design issues in these trials. Again, bottom line, the design issues in almost any type of trial. You gotta design things well no matter what type of trial you do. Um, a cheap, fast trial, you may only get what you pay for, but it still could be a good trial. Uh, starting out with what, ending with what we started out with, you gotta worry about association. These types of trials will generally only give you association. You could try to build on that using all the Bradford Hill criteria and get close to causation, but to genuinely 100% prove causation, you gen generally need a randomized clinical trial. Um, what should you do? Measure, 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 design correctly. 
Um, there are ways to correct for association through something called propensity scores, and I guess Laura really could talk about that. So bottom line is there are problems with the observational studies, but one of the biggest mistakes you can make is trying to do a randomized controlled trial when you don't need to do one, or in fact it might, might not be the right thing for you to do. So always have on your radar screen, these are great trials to do, often for people who don't have big bank accounts or don't have big funders and don't don't think you couldn't necessarily prove wonderful things that could dramatically affect the future well-being of lots and lots of people. Um, and you, just examples of where studies you can't randomize, uh, so be prepared to defend your studies. And here are just some websites on ways to do these studies and how to design them correctly, etc. And so we do have some time, I think, for questions. Yes. So. There are a couple of different ways that we can do the questions. Remember that you all got your cards. There can be some more tomorrow if you need them for the voting. But you can write your questions on those cards if you want to and pass them to some of us that are on the faculty or to Laura or Vanessa. If you all want to stand up so people know what you look like, stand up. They can't see you all the way down there. There you go. So they will also collect the questions if you want. So if you have a question, Raise your hand or raise your card and either on either of our lectures and we can go ahead and answer them. Uh, eu chamo me Zacarias da Silva, uh, sou da Guiné-Bissau. Uh, queria em primeiro lugar agradecer ao professor Jerry pela sua brilhante apresentação e dizer a única coisa que eu queria saber a questão é que, porque ele referiu que as pessoas que não respondem às questões é, são consideradas um, um viés. Eu queria saber porquê. Porque, bom, sabemos que essas pessoas normalmente serão excluídas do estudo. E por que é que são consideradas um, um, viés, um viés? Era só isso. Muito obrigado. So when people don't answer your questions, it's not that those people are biased, but your data is now missing their information. And so what we're lacking when I try to analyze the data, and it does not include information from them, I can't make a good estimation of the sample of the general population because I don't have data from everybody. So I'll give a very precise example because I think it makes it clear. I do studies sometimes of sexual function. And people do not like to talk about sex. S the problem is the people who are having a lot of pain, if they do not want to admit that they are having problems in their sexual relationships, they don't answer those questions. So when I am trying to figure out if a drug is causing a side effect that is impacting their sexual relationships, some people won't talk to me about it because they're embarrassed. So then I have a biased estimate. I don't get the information from people who are having problems but I am probably getting more information from people who are not having problems. So this is the problem when you have missing data. And also, let's say that people were too sick to answer your question. So now I'm only getting information from people who are fairly well. So there can be biases in multiple directions. One study I did, it is actually, I did this um, as part of my dissertation. I had to ask questions of people, and the people who were actually sick had time to fill out all of my surveys. The people who were well were working and did not have time to fill out my surveys. So then I had a bias, but I was actually missing the healthy people in my study. So the people in my study, when I looked at the data I had, they looked like they had far less physical functioning than the actual population as a whole had. 
So does that answer your question? Okay. So somebody else want to raise their hand? Hi, my name is Tiziana. I'm from Salvador. And I would like to know uh, more about the phase zero study, please. Oh dear. Now, John, do you want to answer the question about phase zero? <laughs> Not really. John Gallen asked me a question about phase zero studies in China once. And so do you want to address those since you do more of them at the clinical center first? Uh, we don't do a lot of them, but um, phase zero study is, I understand it, when you have a patient who may be hopeless, has, has a terminal cancer, and you, you have a candidate drug, and you want to see in one, two, three, small number of patients, does it do anything bad? And maybe it will do a miracle, but does it do anything bad to the patient? And, and so it's before you've even designed a phase one trial often, or but sometimes you can design it phase zero, but it's pre-phase one. I don't know. Laura, maybe you want to elaborate on it. Yeah, I was looking up my notes, I have to admit, but I didn't find them yet. So a lot of times we will... So I guess this also I should back up. There are a lot of different people who talk about different phases of trials. And what you do in each of them will vary. So what I define as a phase zero trial, what Dr. Gallen defined as a phase zero trial, may vary depending on who you talk to. So a lot of times when I first did my training, somebody said phase zero to me. I thought it was an animal study. I never thought it involved human beings. Now the US Food and Drug Administration and then also um, the National Cancer Institute said that they wanted to have guidelines to expedite these molecular entities. And so this is where this phase zero idea came up. So as Dr. Gallen mentioned, you kind of have this established at the very earliest opportunity. Before you have any large number of patients involved, this is a very much a first in human drug target study. So that is this element of phase zero. But it's funny because to me, I was taught, well, that's a lot of what you do in phase one. And so these definitions, they're, they're fluctuating. And so what you would call phase zero or phase one, what you call a phase two type of study, these all vary quite a bit. And that's one reason we put the emphasis less on this is phase one, this is phase two, and more on here's a good study design. Here's the number of people you need to consider. Here are the elements that you need to worry about. And so does that answer your question about phase zero? But also, I don't want you to be worried. Well, I guess, how many people raise your card if you work for a regulatory agency? OK, typically, or if you work for a pharmaceutical type of company, OK, we've got a handful of those. So you care more about something being a phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three study. Everybody else, you don't care all that much. You care about how much information, how much evidence has been learned in a study. And a good study design to answer the question and not just the label. Does that help? Uh, I'd like to hear something more about the selection of uh, controls. I know that depends on kind of study you are doing, but maybe some biological characteristics or, or temporal um, uh, variables can be uh, important to, to define the, the, the control that I use in my study. I'd like to hear about Are you talking about a control intervention or a control group and a non-randomized study? I, I, I think about that when uh, he talked about case control studies. I'm the expert, but he's the one with the published case control study that changed medicine. So, okay, fine. 
Anyway, so it is really hard to try to choose these control groups. So what do I think about when I read a study and when I design a study? I think one, you know, who is around? So we talked about the, sometimes I will use siblings in a study. If I think the young environment that people grew up in might matter, if you think interesting questions about genetics, a lot of times you try to find family members that can participate in a study. But you also may want to find somebody who lived in the neighborhood. If you're interested in neighborhood controls or you're thinking about where do I want to go to find folks, these are useful. If you have folks in a hospital setting, you may want to find other people in the hospital setting. Why? Because when you go in a hospital, you're exposed to a lot of potentially bad things. And so you want to control for that element when you choose your control group. Sometimes I do age or sex matching. And so that means I choose a little range around their age. So I'll say, okay, you know, here's Dr. Paul Joaquin. He has a given age. I want to find another male who is plus or minus three years of age with him, but who doesn't have the disease. And so there may be other elements that you want to choose, but this timing can be really picky. And it is something, especially when we think about it, age and sex, where people grew up, where they live, where they work, tend to be the key elements that people are trying to control for and where they were at a given point in time. You know, were they at the World Trade Center area, were they in that cleanup effort or were they outside of it? So those are the types of elements that you want to think about, but really remember you've got to separate out exposures. You don't want everybody to have one exposure and not another. If you're thinking about exposure, yes, no, those are cohort studies. You need to have disease, yes, no, in a case control study. But a really key fact that people forget, you've got to make sure that your control group does not have the disease. They do not meet your caseness definition. And this is one reason in those cohort studies, what you'll see happen is people will then do those nested case control studies there. Because I'm following people for a long period of time, I have all this data on these people, then I see who develops a case and then I can choose people who do not develop that disease, and I already have data to compare them. Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Okay. Do we have any other questions? All right, if you think of any other questions, write them down on a card and let us know. We'll try to answer them throughout the week. Now you have until just before three o'clock and then Dr. Grady is gonna start her talk.